Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Heather Punky, Managing Editor with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have some time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in a space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Additionally, in about a week following the webinar, we will be sending you a copy of the presentation to the email you use to register. At this time, it is my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenter. Jim Goche serves as the Senior Clinical Advisor of Infection Prevention to the North American Healthcare Team of Sealed Air Diversity Care. In this role, Jim serves as an infection prevention and control resource and an industry liaison with organizations to assist with the expansion and improvement of environmental hygiene solutions and science-based best practices. Prior to joining Sealed Air in 2015, Jim was an infection control practitioner for 12 years at Providence Care in Kingston, Ontario. Jim has more than 35 years of experience in medical laboratory technology and infection prevention. His focus has been across many healthcare areas, including acute, ambulatory, behavioral health, and long-term care. He has played many active roles in consulting and bringing expertise to stakeholders across the infection control spectrum, as well as delivering lectures and training to many institutions and organizations throughout the world. Jim has also been an active member with Infection Prevention and Control Canada as a member, a board member, and president throughout his career. Jim has been board certified in Infection Prevention and Control since 1990. And Jim, I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Heather. And welcome everyone to this um, Becker's webinar. The title slide, as you can see here, is I want to discuss solving the healthcare equation. Don't be obtuse and check all the angles. So what this means is that I want to take a look at all of the multiple factors that I've come up with that can impact healthcare associated infection risk and actually, hopefully, prevention. We want to take a look at are the practices that we have in place currently robust enough to actually address this risk of healthcare associated infection transmission and look at what I consider our basic practices that we have and some of the multimodal practices that we have going on within our healthcare setting and hopefully not identify things that you may not have thought about within your own healthcare setting. Because I want to come up with some solutions at the end and areas that I think we need to focus upon. So what I'm going to do is utilize the equation that probably gave most of us nightmares back in our high school days, our algebraic equation, where you have a problem, X, and there are multiple components that go into actually solving the problem. So what I want to do is take that and use it to look at healthcare associated infections because they really are a multifactorial problem. We know there's aspects of what we do in infection prevention that can actually reduce infections. And with that, um, we've even got a table that was published in 2009 through the WHO that looks at all the different studies that have looked at implementing a better hand hygiene program and seeing reduction in infections. And we have a paper listed here by Otter et al. Uh, that looked at how the environment plays a role in this transmission. And in the summary of that paper, there was actually a statement that contaminated surfaces um, in healthcare setting is only part of the multifaceted problem that we face and how the environment plays its role. So this is my premise, that a healthcare associated infection prevention, HAIP, um, is a combination of patient acuity, my PA, hand hygiene, antibiotic stewardship programs, clinical practices, fecal waste management, and environmental disinfection. So this is what I want to talk on, and I'm going to go through each of the six of these main topics uh, and list out what I think are important aspects of each of these that we need to address to solve the healthcare associated infection problem. So let's start with patient acuity. I think it's, a, it's almost a no-brainer for all of us that the sicker a patient is, the more prone they are to picking up an infection within our healthcare setting. And everything that goes into that patient acuity is another factor that can make them more and more and more of a susceptible host. And we do list our patients, our susceptible host, in that traditional chain of transmission or the chain of infection that we all know and love and hopefully utilize in our presentations when we talk to other healthcare workers. So within your patient acuity, 
Um, I uh, did do some time as, a, as an IP in an intensive care unit where I was responsible for the auditing of ventilator-associated pneumonia. And I know if we put a tube down your throat and knock you out, it's going to increase your risk of pneumonia. Uh, we're bypassing all that protective mechanism that we've got in the upper respiratory tract and having the tube in place and micro aspirations going on around it, there's a bunch of stuff that can lead to issues if you're on a ventilator. If you have a portal of entry, in my original equation, I had each of these listed out and it just started to run on and on and on. I've got five of them listed here and they're all part of that chain of transmission again. If you've got an opening into your patient, it's making them more of a susceptible host. And for sure, if you've got a central line in place with a peripheral IV and a urinary catheter after your surgery and you're on a ventilator, that is all stacking up that you are going to become very, very prone to having a healthcare-associated infection. Another part of this patient acuity is if you're old. Now, my definition of old, as I've stated before, changes with every birthday that I have. Uh, but as we age, we have the issue of immune senescence, where our immune system forgets how to respond to a challenge. So if we do get something like a flu shot, we may not produce enough antibodies to get us through that flu season. Or worse yet, if we've been exposed to something like tuberculosis as a child, um, as our immune system wanes, we may not be able to keep that bacteria walled off and we can reactivate tuberculosis that we were exposed to uh, when they were younger. And I've always liked doing that. I love asking the elderly who they knew as a child that had tuberculosis and invariably they're able to give you some answer to that. As we age, our skin gets thin and uh, is much more prone to tearing uh, depending on how we move the elderly within our healthcare setting. Uh, we can tear their skin, which is then another portal of entry. The gastrointestinal tract, it starts to lose its acid secretions, allowing other bacteria to get down to where they shouldn't really be. The respiratory tract starts to change. We're not as good at clearing our secretions. We microaspirate. Our lung elasticity tends to drop off. Uh, in the urinary tract with women, the hormonal changes that goes on changes a lot of issues and makes them more prone to urinary tract infections. Us men have issues with our prostate and being able to uh, completely empty our bladder. Some of the numbers around malnutrition that we see in the elderly are scary. I've seen reports of as high as 85% of the elderly in care are malnourished. And a lot of that isn't that we just don't feed them, it's that they have no interest in food, their dementia may not trigger that they are actually hungry and need to do something. Um, they have a decreased level of taste. There's really no point in eating the food or they're on pureed diet and it just isn't attractive for them to actually eat. All of that is adding to the problem of malnutrition. And then, of course, we love giving the polypharmacy uh, to our elderly, so there are numerous medications that affects all of the previous stuff I've actually talked about. So just having someone in the hospital that's old, they're a susceptible host. Of course, we also like um, if a patient is on antibiotics, it's going to change the microbiome, make them susceptible to overgrowth with fungal infections or clostridium difficile problems. And any comorbidity that goes with this, uh, so the patient I described before that's had their heart surgery with all the lines and they're on a ventilator, if they also have congestive heart failure or they're diabetic, that is all going to lead to more pressure and susceptibility to them of becoming infected with something within our healthcare setting. So I've shortened down the main points here of the ventilator, portal of entry, elderly, antibiotics, and comorbidities, and this is the start of my equation. I want, so our healthcare associated infection is not just patient acuity, but I've listed out the five major parts of patient acuity that we have to recognize with the patients within our healthcare setting. So if we move on to hand hygiene, um, this is something where we've traditionally paid a lot of attention to. Um, I shared this presentation with a couple of infection preventionists and somebody said to me, why do you only have 70% listed here? And part of that is because we still haven't truly defined what is the ideal setting. Um, I don't have the reference up here. Uh, there was an article by Beggs, B-E-G-G-S, in the um, BMC Infectious Disease Journal back in 2008, volume 8. And it was uh, looking at a hypothetical ward and using a mathematical analysis. And when they looked at transmission of MRSA, if we only focused on hand hygiene, their mathematical model was saying after 50% compliance, it doesn't add a lot to stop the transmission if we only focus on hand hygiene. So the compliance that we have to do in terms of auditing, because many of us are um, tasked with providing numbers as to what our hand hygiene is, and we're all aware of the issues with that, of having someone like myself stand in a hallway watching um, other healthcare workers sanitize their hands, my compliance was always in the high 90s because I'm not someone who you can actually hide. 
using secret shoppers or electronic means is another way of actually getting what the true representative number is in terms of hand hygiene um, observation or sorry hand hygiene opportunities but part of doing the auditing is we have to give feedback we actually need to provide the numbers back to the staff so they know what's going on we know a lot of our numbers if it's done with that person standing in the hallway with the Hawthorne effect of being observed the numbers are higher um, while the person is on it and they're probably lower when the auditor is not standing there and that's definitely where the benefits of having the electronic monitoring comes in the staff need to know how they're doing uh, there's many times that I've read posters and articles where staff come up with a way on their own unit of how to remind each other that someone's missed an opportunity. And they will come up with that themselves. I don't like ever going up to a floor saying, okay, if you see somebody who's missed how doing their hand hygiene, let's say this. It needs to come from the staff for sure to help get those numbers up and as high as possible. So we also, another component of the hand hygiene, we need to have alcohol-based hand rub where people are actually going to use it. Um, and when we launched the hand hygiene programs here in Ontario, where I live, um, we recognized that you need to have it at the point of care, the place where the patient, the healthcare worker, and the care is happening. If we don't have it there, people aren't going to go looking for hand hygiene. We need to definitely have it at the point of care. But the point of care location, that really should come from staff. So when we launched our hand hygiene in 2008 uh, with the, in Ontario, the four moments for hand hygiene, as opposed to the World Health Organization's five moments for hand hygiene, we had peel off stickers that we gave to the staff and said, if you're performing a care activity and you turn and think, geez, it'd be handy to have a hand hygiene dispenser there, put a sticker on the wall. So we let that go for a couple of months and we went around and added dispensers to where these stickers were. So we were using like a human factors analysis where we allowed staff to tell us where they needed it as opposed to an infection preventionist saying, you as a nurse need hand hygiene right here. We also have to make sure we trial products so that the staff will actually use the product we put in place. Um, I was approached one day by one of my charge nurses who was saying, we're going to switch products because I found something that's 30% cheaper. I said, whoa, 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 I need to do a trial to make sure staff are going to use it because you can bring a product in that's 30% cheaper, but if no one's going to use it, I've got issues with what's going to happen with our um, infections within my healthcare setting. So we got to make sure that that goes on. And then part of the launch of any hand hygiene program, you need to make sure that the skin care program is in place also so that if staff are forced to wash their hands because they tend to soil their hands or it's a situation where they need to use um, some form of a scrub, we need to make sure their skin integrity is such that they can maintain the washing that we're expecting, or if we've got a product that irritates it, that we can substitute something in that won't irritate their hands. Another component of the hand hygiene is making sure that we have education on the moments for use. Um, I always like to say to staff why we want you to sanitize your hands at moment one, which is before contact with the patient. This is why you brought bugs in from the environment or the healthcare environment, and this is what we need to do. And I tried to do that with any presentation that I put on. So if I was talking about contact precautions and you know, to go into the patient's room that has MRSA, you need to put on gloves, gowns, and um, gloves and gowns. Uh, but you need to sanitize your hands first because moment one, before contact with the patient or the patient's environment, you need to sanitize your hands. Um, so I always try to put in the moment one, the moment two, the moment three into my presentations to remind our staff um, of the four or five moments, depending on what you're using, um, and giving them facts and figures as to why this is important, what they can pick up, what a care practice can actually put on their gloves or put on their skin. And the other important thing is to remind them of the contact time when you're doing education for hand-based or alcohol-based hand rubs. Um, to squirt it on and have it evaporate off in two to three seconds because you didn't have a good dose on your hands doesn't affect a good hand hygiene clean. Um, most of the products that are out there are recommending 15 to 30 seconds. And I actually like the automatic dispensers where you put your hand underneath, it puts out a volume of alcohol on your hands and you have to rub it in. Uh, you don't have any say in it. And those dispensers generally dispense enough that your hands are wet for that 15 to 30 seconds. I love the phone call that I had after we introduced those from one of my uh, rehab staff going, the dispenser's broken. It puts way too much in my hands. I said, no, that's what you're supposed to do. Really? My hands have never been this wet. So we run into that problem too. Another component of hand hygiene, and it's well recognized through the WHO documents and other studies, that if you have a champion, either on the unit or a site champion or the C-suite, uh, you've got your CEO down doing auditing or the CFO is down doing auditing, there's a lot better buy-in to the hand hygiene uh, program that you'll have in your healthcare setting and you'll probably see higher compliance. 
The other aspect of hand hygiene component is patient hand hygiene. Does the patient know that there's a product there that they can actually use if it is within their reach? Do they even recognize what the product is? Because some of our patients with dementia or some of the elderly may not even recognize a pump bottle of soap or alcohol because they're used to using a bar when they wash their hands. Do they understand when they need to perform hand hygiene? Can they perform their own hand hygiene? These are all factors that we have to put into this equation around hand hygiene for sure. And I think patients being admitted, we need to assess that. Are you able to do your own hand hygiene? The empowerment bullet here is also an aspect of this. We have to let them know they can do their hand hygiene. There's a lot of empowerment programs where we give education to the patient and say, you are allowed to ask about um, have I performed hand hygiene before I perform this uh, technique on you? That empowerment side, I've seen conflicting articles on that as to whether that's effective or not, but it's another aspect of the um, program here. So I still have more on the hand hygiene components. Do the family and visitors know uh, that there's a product there that they're allowed to use? Can they assist their loved one or their friend um, with their hand hygiene if they think there's an opportunity for them to keep it done? Can we utilize the family and visitors to monitor? And monitor and audit uh, staff hand hygiene. I've heard of that aspect being done in clinical settings where uh, ambulatory centers where they will give people before they go in to see the healthcare provider a little questionnaire saying watch to see if they do their hands as they come into the room and after they've touched you and then when you leave the room after the examination you fill that out and provide it back to the auditor to actually monitor what happens behind the door. Uh, this uh, diagram here is actually from the Provincial Infectious Disease Advisory Committee based in Ontario in 2014 from their hand hygiene program. And it summarizes all of this stuff again. If we go from the top and around to the right, we've got to have buy-in from leadership, do our monitoring with feedback, um, make sure that we have the clients, patient resident engaged in this and that they know what they're supposed to be doing. We need our champions, education, environmental changes to make sure that the product's where it needs to be. So if I summarize that into these aspects of those um, components, that we have product, point of care location, feedback on what is going on with it, education to the staff, champions, patient hand hygiene, and the family and visitor involvement, my equation that used to have the patient acuity now expands to having hand hygiene aspects involved with it. So I want to move on to the antibiotic stewardship program capacity of my equation. Antibiotic stewardship programs are starting to get a lot more traction. Um, there's now webinars occurring regularly out of the CDC on antibiotic stewardship programs. I know in each state and probably each province, I've seen literature um, coming out indicating there's programs available, there's support available with it. Um, the numbers are awful uh, that we know there's a lot of antibiotics prescribed in the community that are unnecessary. We know there's a lot of um, antibiotics that put patients that are in long-term care at risk of picking up Clostridium difficile. Uh, there's a couple of papers here that I just wanted to comment on to show that a good antibiotic stewardship program actually works. So um, the first paper here was a look at surgical, cardiac surgical infections where they made sure that they had a full program in place for having antibiotics on board before the surgery actually started. And in the paper listed here, they were able to show a combined infection rates of both the sternal wound and deeper tissue things um, decreased by 66%. And the paper by Bosco is they actually examined the organisms that were being recovered from hip infections. And they found that they seem to have a lot of gram-negative rods growing out of infected hips compared to their knees. So they modified the prophylaxis for infected hips to include more antibiotics beyond just using cefazolin at one gram. The patient would either get gentamicin or as as trionam added in, and they found that this actually reduced significantly the number of infections that they were seeing in their hip arthroplasties. Uh, so this is just something around an antibiotic stewardship program, instead of just giving the drug, but actually looking at what you're trying to prevent. And the basis of any antibiotic stewardship program is having the right drug via the right route for the right length of time, and when you know what the actual causative organism is, giving the right dose, stepping down to a narrow spectrum. Um, there's another paper that looked at formulary restrictions that I found very, very interesting where they got rid of the real broad spectrum antibiotics and tried to go with something a little bit narrower. And in the study listed here, what they did is they tried to get rid of the fluoroquinolones, the cephalosporins, clindamycin, and amoxicillin, which are fairly broad spectrum antibiotics. And they, they, not necessarily the broad spectrum antibiotics, but they tended to precipitate C. difficile in their setting. So they went to low risk antibiotics, such as penicillin, clarithromycin, doxycycline, gentamicin, vancomycin, 
trimethoprim, and nitrofurantoin. And by doing this, they found that they had a decrease in infections uh, or less C. difficile. And it was, again, quite significant what they did by just sort of putting some restrictions into the formulary that they had within their um, setting. So let's look at that in my equation. So we want to make sure we have the right drug by the right route, the right duration, de-escalation, um, and the step down that has to go on here and the formulary restrictions. And if I put that into my equation along with my patient acuity and my hand hygiene, I have my antibiotic stewardship component of this equation. So the equation, as you can see, is getting longer and longer here. Um, let's take a look at some of the clinical practices that can affect our patients and hopefully prevent infections within the patients. We're getting much better at recognizing that there's more options out there. The traditional iodine or pulviodine that we were using for um, preparation or for putting in lines, there's been some good studies to show that a chlorhexidine tincture was more effective than iodine. We do our decolonization therapies, and there's a lot of change that's going on here with these studies also uh, in looking at what we need to do to try to prevent certain kinds of infections. Um, so there's um, swabbing of patients that are coming in. Uh, this is a practice where they're looking for both methicillin-sensitive and methicillin-resistant staph aureus, and if the patient's colonized, making use of mepiracin. A lot of times we're having patients bathe with chlorhexidine before they come in for surgery to reduce that bacterial load that's present on their skin. Prophylactic antibiotics um, falls into my clinical practices, and this is the same paper I referred to from the Journal of Arthroscopy, where they knew they were having different bugs show up and they needed a little bit more help. Um, so they made sure that they were using antibiotics to cover the organisms they were seeing and making sure it was on board before the incision actually happened and show that reduction in their hip infections. And then there's always the bundles. Um, we've been reading, I've been hearing about bundles now for many, many, many years where we now have our uh, central line insertion bundles. Uh, there's a paper that looked at that and how that could reduce the actual number of infections up to 66%. Um, throughout their 18-month study period. Uh, the Monroe paper took a look at all of the different evidence that's out there related to VAP and looked at trying to get a good revision to the patient care to try to cut down on the amount of pneumonia that we're actually seeing or adverse effects um, or incidents that were happening because of the patient being vented. Uh, it's a good summary article there that I've got listed and all the references for the um, papers that I've got listed here will be at the end of the presentation. So if we factor in our clinical practices, um, I narrow that down to the skin prep, decolonization therapies, prophylactic antibiotics, and having the bundles in place. And that adds into our healthcare associated in question to give me another line uh, that expands out like so. So let's take a look at fecal waste management. Um, I've been lecturing on this for years and years and years. Um, we still seem to have issues based on what I'm seeing being spread within our healthcare facilities. So we need to take a good look at what we do with our bedpans or commode buckets. We need to make sure that we're either using a single-use disposable plastic item that gets disposed of with the fecal waste or the urinary waste within it, or we can use paper-based products that are, again, transported to a machine that then macerates them and flushes away the residue. We've got machines that you can put the full bedpan into the machine, shut the machine, the machine washes it, and provides a level of disinfection through very hot water at a certain length of time. And we've also got liner bags that contain absorbent pads that solidify the urine or the feces that's defecated into the bedpan or bucket. You then tie up the bag and put it out in the regular waste stream. But this is all trying to contain the amount of fecal waste that we've got going on. I, have been pushing in my own little quiet ways through blogs and chat areas that it would be very helpful when we see papers on outbreaks of gram-negative organisms, things such as CRE or even C. difficile, VRE, uh, possibly MRSA, that we, within the outbreak study as to what was put into place to try to stop the outbreak, they indicate how many patients were actually incontinent, how many patients wore a brief or a diaper, within the study, how many patients required assistance with their toileting, and how many were fully continent? And does that factor into what we were seeing in terms of the transmission and the location of it? If you have one of these organisms get into a facility where everyone is fully continent, does their own peri care, has wonderful hand hygiene, my hypothesis is you would not see much spread compared to a facility where everyone is briefed. 
and everyone requires assistance with their toileting or they're using a bedpan that's being rinsed out within the patient room or the patient washroom, which will spray all of these gram-negative and gram-positive organisms into the environment for carriage to other people. Uh, so I don't think we should be allowing at all any rinsing of bedpans or commode buckets uh, within the patient room or within the washroom. Uh, it needs to be done in a very specialized area for sure. I've been pushing for a while that um, any time anything is being done with feces, frontline staff should have personal protective equipment on. Um, if you're lifting a patient off of a uh, toilet and pivoting the back into the wheelchair, uh, you need to provide some assistance with the peri care, put a gown on, have some gloves on. The gloves we generally do really well, but let's start protecting our clothing and see if that helps with any of our rates that are going on. I've also been pushing in my own little world uh, for a protocol on how do you change someone's brief or diaper, right out step by step by step. As a medical laboratory technologist, everything I touched or handled in the laboratory was an action verb starting the sentence. Do this, add this, incubate, um, add this, and that'll give you what's going on. I've never seen that for how to change an incontinent adult out of their brief that is bedridden and can't assist you with it. I want a protocol where it states when to change the gloves, where to place the soiled articles, what to disinfect after the change is done. Very directive, um, because my son is now in nursing and he's the one that came home and I said, so how do you learn to change someone? He said, well, we practiced it on a mannequin and I learned from our uh, preceptor in the lab, which was their technique. And I said, did they give you anything written? And he says, well, no, it's just a practical thing. You learn how to do it. I'm thinking, no, nope, I want to see something written. So in my fecal waste management line here, um, again, we've got to do something different with the way we handle containers. I really want to emphasize we should never be rinsing out anything within the patient space. PPE, uh, to make sure that we've got it, not just gloves, and having a good protocol written. So that'll go into my fecal waste management line here. Environmental disinfection. I think I've saved the best for last on this. Um, environmental disinfection, you know, it's a standard thing of EVS goes around and cleans. Well, that's not true. EVS goes around and cleans and disinfects, but there's other aspects of cleaning and disinfection that also has to be done. So I think with our environmental disinfection, we have to be very, very clear what EVS cleans and when. Is it just once a day? Is it twice a day? Is it after every use? Is there an audit system in place to see if it truly was cleaned? And by auditing, I mean using ATP or using a fluorescent or using a visual method. We need to also understand what does nursing have to clean and when? I don't like having nursing clean. I think they've got other things they need to be doing, but there's some stuff nurses just have to clean and they need to be trained how to do that properly. And if there are other items within our healthcare setting that other staff are cleaning, when do they clean it and are they being audited? Because I always thought it would be very interesting with some of the auditing that's going on and stuff that nurses have to clean it, such as a bladder scanner, um, having a way to mark it to make sure it's actually being done after it is used. So this is a document that we actually have uh, within Sealed Air uh, where we try to list out everything that would be in an area, uh, markdown so you can go up and do an audit of what does EBS clean, what does the nursing staff clean, is there other items that other people are cleaning, and how frequently is it done? Is it daily, is it weekly, is it monthly, is it after every use? And I think if you've gone through your facility and make sure this is very, very clear, you won't have that um, sickening incidence of someone saying to you, I thought they cleaned it, and they turn around and point at someone else who says, no, 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 I thought they cleaned it. Uh, that's not helping out our patients and it's going to lead to some issues. And with environmental disinfection, I also think the family and visitors can do some cleaning, not that it would be mandated, not that it's a requirement for family and visitors to clean the environment, but I know if I was sitting in a, a hospital room with a loved one of mine and there was a disinfectant wipe that was safe enough to be within the patient bed space, I'd probably be wiping things down. And I have done this with a family member uh, who was being admitted to a room. And with my background, I found a disinfectant wipe, wiped off his overbed table, found that there was still some debris on it, and then proceeded to clean up the side rails and the toilet and me being the educated healthcare provider, uh, read my brother the riot act saying, Anytime you get out of bed, you need to sanitize your hands. And before they bring your meals in, I want you to wipe off your tray. Um, so I think it's something we also need to start looking at is, are there products that we can leave within the patient's room uh, that won't affect the patient or the family with its use with a little bit of instructions that, you know, this is here, it's not a baby wipe, please don't flush them. Uh, but it would also help some of the environmental disinfection that I think we might be missing. So part of our environmental disinfection or the ED here is, you know, what are we using in the room? What are we allowed to actually take in and use around the patient? 
what product can actually be used near the patient without bothering the patient due to the toxicity of the actual chemical itself. And our staff actually comfortable using the product near the patient. There was a, a poster at Shea uh, this past year here, so that would have been in 2015, uh, where there was a hospital introducing a new agent to be used. And they brought in their change management people. And they had stakeholder meetings. They did a whole bunch of education. They redesigned all their carts and had checklists. Uh, who did what when? They switched to the new product. And the fluorescent markers dropped for bed rails dropped from 64% to 12%. And they, part of the hypothesis in the poster was because of the pungent smell of the disinfectant, EVS staff were afraid to use it near the patient. Uh, and it was a very interesting poster. I'm hoping that uh, the lab that actually did this gets it published because it's something that we have to take into consideration. If your EVS staff are scared of the product that they're using and not using it near the patient, that is a huge high risk area that has to be disinfected on a very regular basis. Another part of environmental disinfection then is what is the PPE that is required uh, to actually um, use the product? What is the contact time? If you're still using a quad within your healthcare facility with a 10 minute contact time for the easy to kill bacteria like E. coli and staff, the, the, the Joint Commission loves coming in and measuring that evaporation rate or just asking staff, what is the contact time that you have to have to kill the regular hospital pathogens that you're working with? If it's a five minute contact time, three minute contact time, are the surfaces staying wet for that length of time? Even with some products that have high alcohol content, we have to be very aware that sometimes they evaporate off before that one minute contact time. And that can lead to an issue of not achieving the disinfection that you think might be happening. In environmental disinfection, if you're using a concentrate, you also have to be aware that your dilution control system may not be working in the manner that you think it is. Does it deliver the proper concentration? Are you actually checking it? Um, do the staff members have to add a little bit of stuff to it because it doesn't look like it's the right color because there's something going on? And in the Boyce study listed here, they were preparing to do a trial of another product and they wanted to make sure that they weren't experiencing the quat binding where the actual activity in a quaternary based product binds onto the cleaning cloths. Uh, so part of the study listed here in Boyce is A, they found out they were having quat binding, uh, both with their microfiber and with their cotton cloths, and with the brand of disposable wipes they were actually using that they added the reagent to. And then they discovered that none of their diluting systems were working properly. Uh, part of it was water pressure. Two of them were just broken. One was empty. Uh, a lot of it was water pressure issues that were modified by the uh, provider of the actual product. But it's the kind of thing we need to make sure this is working. And I can't recommend the frequency of checking this, but it's something that um, you want to make sure that what's coming out of that diluter is actually appropriate for what you're going to be using it for and that the product that you're using isn't going to be absorbed or damage, um, be absorbed through the quat binding or damage surfaces and fabrics. There is no true ideal disinfectant that meets all of Dr. Ritala's 14 requirements out there. Um, there are some that get awfully close to it, um, but we have to factor all of this stuff into our environmental disinfection. The last one, this came from actually having a chat with an EVS manager about part of my equation, you need to make sure you have enough money to do what they want you to do and enough staff. One of the first areas, as we're well aware, even in 2016, that gets cut is your EVS staff budget. Uh, and it's starting to get a little bit scary that if you're going to start cutting, what becomes the acceptable increase in infections to the healthcare facility by cutting your EVS department? You need to take a good look at this and make sure that there is enough resources to clean the way infection preventionists think it's going to be done or needs to be done. So if we look at my equation uh, for environmental disinfection, this tends to go on a little bit because we need to make sure the EVS knows what they're cleaning, we audit them, we need to know what nursing has to clean, other staff have to clean, if there's stuff that the family and visitors can clean, what product are we going to be using that everyone's comfortable with using, do we know what PPE is required for the product, do we have the right contact time, the right dilution, the compatibility of the chemistry of what we're cleaning with, and do we have enough resources to actually do what we think we're doing. So that's quite an extensive list to add on to my healthcare associated infection equation when I put this into the bottom. Uh, so there's a lot of numbers here uh, that I've been talking about. So my function, um, anybody been counting what FN actually is, how many actual aspects I put into here, or if you want to make a guess before I show you the next slide, uh, the number seems to be creeping up. But when you actually go back and count that, there's 36 factors that I've listed here that I think have a role in healthcare associated infections. So our traditional focus is always been, you know, we need to have good hand hygiene, 
We need to have our environmental services people going around once every 24 hours uh, using a product that has the right contact time to make sure that that's sort of what the traditional focus has been. In the last few years, we've added in the importance of antibiotic stewardship practices across the board and our clinical practices, um, especially with the bundles and stuff like that. I think that's been some of the more exciting work that's been done. Uh, to recognize that there's other things that we can put into with the checklists and making sure that we have full barrier precautions in place for the insertion of central lines, stuff like that. It's been fun reading those uh, articles that have looked at what they put into place and the reduction in healthcare associated infections that you can get from that. But if I actually just put those into what we've been looking at with our healthcare associated infections, and those would be the red ones if you're actually viewing this in color, um, there's still a lot of other stuff that there should be some discussion occurring within your healthcare setting to make sure that we've got these aspects covered. Is this too complicated as part of my discussion? Uh, have I got stuff in here that you don't feel totally binds into a healthcare associated infections? We can have that in the question and answer period if you want to call me out on it or type in a response there. But there's other factors within that equation that I think we need to really take a good look at. Patient hand hygiene is an area that we're starting to see more and more articles. Um, it was, it's been encouraging to see the number of poster sessions that were done at APEC this year. Uh, there's articles showing up in the American Journal of Infection Control looking at um, allowing patients to actually perform their hand hygiene. So my assessment that um, I worked on this uh, at Providence Care when I was there and we were trying to get this implemented of assessing the patient on admission for their capability of performing hand hygiene. And it was as simple as taking a pump bottle of hand sanitizer, putting them in front of them, putting the product in front of them and saying, do you know what this is? And most people say, well, yeah, that's my hand sanitizer. Okay, show me how to use it. And if you have that five pounds of pressure that it takes to put that plunger down into your hands and you wipe it into your hands, I then just give you a little list of when you need to use it. You know, whenever you leave the room, when you come back to the room, before you eat, whenever you come out of the bathroom, and anytime you feel your hands might be dirty. Uh, see you later. If you don't know what it is, and don't, or if you know it's hand sanitizer, but you don't have the strength to press the plunger, or if you press the plunger and don't rub your hands together, let's get some signage above this patient's bed space to let people know they need assistance. The little sign here was just designed by using um, the pamphlet making aspect publisher in Word. Uh, that I went in and made this up. Um, you can print this off on peelable stickers, stick it up above the patient's bed. So if I, as a food services worker, was coming in to drop a tray off, I would see that up above the bed and say, here, Mr. Goche, uh, let me help you with your hand hygiene before you have your lunch here. Simple little step to put into place. There was a paper I've talked about in some of my other presentations by Gagné uh, that was published in the Journal of Hospital Infection in 2010. And all they did in their intervention was welcome the patient at the door, explain hand hygiene, twice a day showed up in the room to say, let me see you do your hands, and all of their MRSA infections, pneumonia, central line infections, transmission of it dropped by washing the patient's hands. Uh, so that was a very interesting study. I'm sorry I didn't have the um, reference on my presentation for that, and I can provide that after if you send in the question on that. Fecal waste management. We've got to get better at how we handle fecal waste. Uh, there's no question in my mind. Uh, this paper listed here in 2007 by Dr. Boyce um, actually looked at how much MRSA can be carried in the rectum and put into the environment by patients who have diarrhea. So what the study actually was is stool specimens sent to the laboratory for C. difficile testing were cultured for MRSA. And if the specimen was positive in the three to four plus range, and at four plus, I'm considering that's almost pure uh, MRSA coming out of the patient's rectum, they would go up and swab the environment around the patient. And they found if a patient was colonized with MRSA, they put more into the environment than if they were active with C. difficile, as long as they had loose stool. And their summary is that feces is the main source for VRE, EFBL, CRE, and MRSA. Um, the, the paper actually only looked at the MRSA. My premise is stool is the reservoir for all of these organisms. And if we see the transmission of these organisms, there's something wrong with the way we handle fecal waste management. We've watched this with the new bugs that have been introduced. As we had CRE or CPOs show up in a healthcare facility or a patient gets discharged from acute care hospital to the long-term care facility, how rapidly it can spread through these facilities. And it always gets back to, I wish they would publish how they were handling the feces within the healthcare setting. 
If it's just a matter that the bedpan's rinsed out uh, in the patient bathroom and put back on the bedside table, let's put that into the paper so we can see some of the other factors that may be leading to some of the problems that we've got going on here to recognize the reservoir. Our environmental disinfection, I recognize that our EVS staff are doing the best job possible with the time they've got once a day. In some cases, um, some recommendations and guidelines around um, C. difficile and BRE, they may go back a second time to do the high touch surfaces. But that's not adequate. I think we need to get a lot better at indicating when we need to clean the environment around the patient. So this point of care prevention uh, that we've been toying with launching and getting ideas out there that there's certain procedures that are done in a patient bed space that we need to disinfect the surfaces. Our list at this point, which is moments to disinfect the patient's environment, is anytime you're going to put a food tray down on an overbed table, I think it would be a good idea to wipe that overbed table off with the disinfectant. They're going to be eating off of this. Not everyone's able to keep all of the food on the tray that comes into the room. Everyone's going to touch that overbed table and pull it towards them to get their food closer to them. And if that's not cleaned and disinfected, I think it becomes a very good fomite for spreading stuff within that patient's environment. Number two, after any procedure involving feces within the patient bed space, there's something that has to be wiped down. And you've got to have a product right there that staff can use. If staff have to go looking for the product, even if it's just going back to the doorway to get their disinfectant wipe or their bottle and cloth, worse yet, they have to go down the hallway to find a disinfectant if they think they may have soiled a surface, that disinfection is not going to happen. Number three, after any wound dressing, I've had some nurses say to me, what do you mean after any wound dressing? And I've just seen bad experiences where dirty bandages are taken off and dropped on bedside tables while new dressing is put on. Um, I think we've got better with that, and I'd be willing to take that off if people would like to discuss that. After patient bathing within the bed space, there's probably stuff that needs to be wiped down because you've had bath water being splashed around that will have a certain amount of flora that we need to make sure doesn't stay in the patient's environment. After assistance with productive cough or vomiting, um, so you've got a patient that retches, um, uh, produces sputum, a uh, patient with the starts of something like norovirus or medication-induced vomiting. We get them cleaned up. There's something that has to be wiped down within that patient's environment. I'm sure of it. And then number six, anytime surfaces are visibly soiled. Um, I was quite surprised to talk to an EVS person that was discussing a product going, well, I don't like that product because I couldn't get the dried feces off the overbed table. I'm thinking, what do you mean dried feces on the overbed table? Well, it's probably been there since last night. I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean there's dried feces on an overbed table in front of a patient? That should not be there. Um, or even dried food. I couldn't get the ketchup off the table. Well, why, when the tray got picked up, why wouldn't somebody go, oh, there's ketchup on the table and get a wipe and clean that up? Um, probably because it wasn't readily available within the point of um, prevention or the point of care that's actually happening to that patient. So, I've talked a lot about the different aspects that go into a healthcare-associated infection. Um, looking at the patient acuity, hand hygiene, antibiotic stewardship program, um, clinical practices, the fecal waste management, environmental disinfection. It's a very complicated little infection or, or, uh, equation that we've got here. And even there's a lot of little subsets in those 36 ones that I spoke of. If I ever broke out all the little subsets, I think I'd just make myself terribly depressed as to what how multifactorial this can actually be to try to stop infection spread within our healthcare setting. I can't even give you percentages of what will be reduced by this. I have some very specific examples, you know, the antibiotic stewardship program where the one uh, infection rates were dropped a certain percentage and stuff like that. I was going to play further with this in terms of, you know, if we get really good fecal waste management, does that make everything else much easier or eliminate some of the other infections that we're seeing? This is still a bit of a work in progress in that sense. Um, how much each one of these factors feeds in to, um, and I notice on here I don't have my patient acuity. I'm missing one of my bubbles. There should be six of them. Uh, the patient acuity we can't do much about. We're a healthcare setting. We recognize when somebody's really, really, really sick or has all of those components of the patient acuity, they're very, very susceptible, and they're usually in critical care areas. And our critical care areas know they're working with the sickest of the sick. These are the ones that tie in um, and contribute a certain percentage to reducing healthcare associated infections. I'm hoping over the next little while we'll start seeing um, discussion happening within our infection preventionist groups here as to how each of these can feed in and hopefully reduce our infections and provide a very safe environment for our patients when they come to healthcare settings. So as I said, I've got the references listed here and I believe we've got um, just under 15 minutes to take some questions.
Yes, thank you so much, Jim, for that fantastic presentation. As you mentioned, we will now begin today's question and answer session. For our audience members, please submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter Question for Staff and clicking Send. We will try to get through as many questions as we have time for today. Jim, the first question kind of you touched on in the last slide, but maybe you can expand on it a little further. The question is, for the 36 different factors in the equation, are they weighted differently? And which factors should be weighted more? Yeah, in terms of how to weight the factors, that's, a, that's the question that I was having trouble with as I put this presentation together. Um, I've always, I, it's, it's not a bias, I just, I don't know if it's because I'm a microbiology tech and I'm used to working with human feces in my laboratory and seeing the vast, vast number of bacteria that are present in this. Um, I think one of the, easier things to get is how we handle feces within our healthcare setting. Um, and I'd love to see, there are some papers out there where it's been introduced, where they'll bring in thermal disinfection, or they'll bring in a macerator, or they'll switch over to using the um, liner bags with absorbent pads, and see a reduction in fecally um, reservoir organisms. Um, and if you get it, I, I think that's an area that we just haven't looked hard enough in North America. When I've done some traveling in Europe or done presentations with people from Europe, they do not rinse bedpans and commode buckets within a patient setting. They either have those um, aspects that I've already described. They either have a macerator, they either have a thermal disinfection unit, or they're using liner bags. And I know I've had visitors from Europe come to some of my healthcare settings and are rather appalled at how lackadaisical we are around fecal waste management. The antibiotic stewardship programs are being mandated in many cases in Canada with our Accreditation Canada, which is very similar to the Joint Commission inspections that come in. It's now a required organizational practice that you have an antibiotic stewardship program in place. Um, as part of our inspection. And this is for all facilities. So even smaller facilities and stuff, at least an awareness of, we know what our formulary is, we know what our resistance pattern are with our organisms. Um, you, we can do more on it where if the pharmacist is seeing the same antibiotic being used, they can have the discussion with the doctor. The clinical care practice stuff that we've talked about, I think is already starting to make a good contribution to this. And I emphasize the other one of this is the patient hand hygiene. Uh, we've got so many patients that are feeding the healthcare environment to themselves because they can't clean their hands. They either can't get to a sink, they don't have hand sanitizer present in front of them, or they're just not totally aware of it. And I sort of skipped over that really quickly. Um, I know when my mother-in-law had gone into a, a, an assistive living facility, she had nursing care that she required on a daily basis, she did not recognize the soap dispenser in her room that you hit with the heel of your palm to put soap on it. So she wasn't washing her hands after she could toilet herself. So I went home and brought in my bar of soap and put it on the counter and she automatically washed her hands with it. So there's also this generational thing that we have to watch uh, in terms of what we have available for the patient and whether they recognize that it's actually there for them. So my two top two in terms of waiting is definitely how we handle feces within our healthcare setting and the patient hand hygiene. Great, thank you so much, Jim. That was super informative. Our next question um, isn't one of the 36 factors that you mentioned. It says, what about dirty instruments in the OR and their impact on surgical site infections? Dirty instruments in the OR and their impact on surgical site infections. Well, there shouldn't be dirty instruments in the OR. Um, that's uh, sort of an aspect of this. Uh, that that's a, you know, that is almost part of the uh, clinical practices um, that we need to have good auditing of our reprocessing areas within healthcare settings. Um, if a uh, sterile pack is open and you see a chunk of something on part of your sterile equipment, it's just not used. Um, if a piece of surgical equipment goes where it's not supposed to go, uh, as a lab technologist, my understanding is anybody in the room is able to scream, wait, don't use that. Um, or if anyone breaks sterility. Um, I, I've been present at lectures where uh, medical students are being trained uh, to go into the OR and that's the first rule of thumb. If someone says you broke sterility, you broke sterility, do not give anyone grief. You broke sterility. Um, don't give them a hard time. No, I didn't. Just do what you're told to do within the thing. So dirty equipment within the OR uh, is a huge, uh, 
institutional problem in that sense that you're not getting the equipment clean before it's being um, disinfected or washed. After the disinfection washing step and the packaging, they're not doing the obvious thing that's supposed to happen because you can't sterilize junk that's on equipment. Um, so I never considered that part of this because there's some stuff I have to assume is happening and that you've got a central processing area that's going to take care of the equipment. Great point. Thank you, Jim. The next question is, are there I'm sorry, are there many cleaning products or wipes that are safe to be kept in a patient's room in long-term care? The, with cleaning products, to, what you've got to look at, if you're going to put it into the, um, especially in long-term care, if you're going to put it within the patient's space or in the patient's room, take a look at its HEMIS rating. Um, you know, is it flammable? Do you need to have PP on? And is it caustic to things like the, the eyes? Um, if you've got a product that has a zero, zero, zero rating, um, and indicates about the only time that you actually need to have gloves on is for blood or body fluids. That's the kind of product that you've got to look for. Uh, so you need to go to the manufacturer's recommendations that's on the label, and you need to go to the safety data sheet that comes with the product and take a good look at it, and then experiment with yourself. Um, I've got products that I'm quite happy to take a rub on my face. I know of products that I would be very happy to have next to my demented mother who's in care, because if she does get into it, it's not going to hurt her. Um, if she plays with it on her hands for a long period of time because it's sitting next to her bed, it may dry out her skin a little bit with prolonged usage. Uh, but there are products out there that I personally would put right next to my mom and have no qualms about it at all. Great, thank you. We have another audience member with a long-term care specific question. She says, bars of soap are not allowed in long-term care. Do you have another suggestion to encourage hand hygiene? Okay, so my understanding around bars of soap, they're not allowed for staff to use. Um, and personally speaking, um, I would not understand why we couldn't have a bar of soap at a sink. I probably wouldn't use it in the shower because of the slip risk that could go on. Uh, but, you know, I appreciate staff should not be using bars of soap. Um, you shouldn't have bars of soap in common washrooms or numerous patients are using it. Uh, so if you've got a two-bedded long-term care room, that might become more of an issue. What you're going to have to look at is constant ongoing training uh, for the resident to understand that this is where they get their hand hygiene um, liquid from and that they need to do this kind of a push. But as we finesse, for want of a better term, as we get older and start to forget um, first in is last out. I've also heard the expression, so we will always remember how to wash our hands the way we were taught as a child. So my son will have no trouble in 70 years when he's in a long-term care facility because he's used to using the hand pump, uh, either the pump from the top down into one hand or using your heel to dispense soap into your hand. In terms of other suggestions for it, if you're not allowed to have bar soap, it's going to be that ongoing reinforcement or visual hand care with the resident. So before meals in a long-term care facility, someone goes around, put the alcohol on the, on the uh, resident's hands, and if need be, help rub it in. Um, or as you go to get a patient and remove them from the room to take them to a common eating area, you stop at the sink with them, explain again that this is what the soap is. Now this is my ideal world that you have the time to do this and you're not trying to get you know, 30, 40 residents down to a common eating area. But I think doing that where um, the hand sanitizer is done in front of the staff before the meal is served is another option that we could use. Great, that was super helpful. Thank you, Jim. The next question is, how effective do you think, how effective do you feel barriers like gowns and gloves are for reducing transmission of MRSA and VRE infections? Well, it depends if the barrier is used properly. Uh, the big scary thing, and I've, I've lectured this, if, and for the IPs on the line here, if you ever want to watch nurses' eyes get real big, tell them we're going to remove all gloves for pericare, and you have to use bare hands, because I can guarantee you they're going to wash their hands. I think one of the biggest problems we've had in infection prevention with the advent of our bloodborne pathogens and uh, universal precautions way back in the 80s is we recommended gloves for blood or body fluid and gowns if there's a risk of getting splashed. So any potential contact or contact with blood or body fluid, you need to have gloves on, but we never lectured when to take them off and when to change them. So that's why we tend to have people put gloves on to protect them from the patient's blood or body fluid and then grossly soil the environment. And that's where my premise comes from on my list of six things of when we need to clean the environment. You can do perfect 
changing of a patient in bed. And the last safety device that you do is pull up the side rail with a glove that probably has some degree of soiling on it. Um, if you can get the glove off and pull up the side rail, bonus. Um, but let's just make sure the side rail is as clean as possible for the patient. And the next staff member coming in to lower the side rail by having a wipe of that side rail and disinfection happen at that point of care. Barriers can be the bane of our existence. Part of the problems I find with gowns is they're not as available as they should be, or we've got a gown that doesn't have any fluid, um, not retention, but it stops the fluid from getting through uh, the wicking. Uh, we used to use cloth gowns that if it got wet, it soaked right through. And uh, the Canadian Standards Association came out that said barrier gowns have to have some um, fluid resistance uh, to them to make it so that if you do put a gown on and you do get splashed, you've got time to take the gown off before it actually soaks through. Face protection is another one. Um, as we watch some of these infections travel around the world, things like MERS, CoV, um, we don't have readily available face protection even for staff to use. And then there's always the chance of contaminating ourselves when we remove it. So a lot of the barrier stuff, they are effective if used appropriately. No glove is 100% guaranteed of not letting something through. Hence, we always make sure that we perform <clears throat> some form of hand hygiene after we remove our protective um, equipment. And that has to be taught very, very well. And we need to audit how staff are using barriers. Perfect. Thank you, Jim. I think we have time for one or two more questions. This next one is about environmental cleaning. Does terminal cleaning need to include washing walls? <laughs> uh, walls, terminal cleaning. Um, I am a firm believer in visual inspection of walls and cleaning them if there's evidence of um, soiling, or they shouldn't be dusty. Uh, so there has to be frequently enough cleaning of the walls to make sure that there isn't visible dust on them. After every discharge, if the patient was on contact precautions, I've never really felt walls are a high risk of transmission in that chain of transmission. If they are a reservoir, how do we complete the um, mode of transmission? Uh, so if I go into a patient's room to have a discussion with them and I stand there with my gloves and my gown on and I'm leaning up against the wall, striking a casual pose, and then perform care on that patient with my glove, yeah, they could be a potential reservoir for organism. Uh, but I don't think many healthcare providers will lean up against the wall with a gloved hand and then provide care. We may lean against it with our back while we're having a chat with the patient. If you've been in there for a while, it's the low back release that we're trying to do. So if there's bugs on the wall, I still don't understand how that completes the chain of transmission. Uh, so in my ideal little world, and I'm sitting in a room here with some other experts in environmental cleaning, as long as they're not looking dusty or there's not visual soiling on the walls, I'm not quite sure what doing the walls and ceilings on um, every discharge is going to achieve for us. Perfect. Okay. We have time for one last question here, Jim. It is okay. about fecal waste management. Huh? Um, commode liners were mentioned as a possible, possible alternative to emptying commodes in patient toilet or hopper. However, staff and patients alike tend to complain about the smell when placed in a trash receptacle, even if it's emptied on a regular basis. Any recommendations to addressing this problem from your past experience? Um, if the use of a, some device is unavailable. So uh, there's, um, I, 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 I'm hopefully we'll try to do a little video on this. There's two ways to tie a bag. Uh, one is called bunny ears and one is called goose neck. Bunny ears are where you take two handfuls of the plastic and you do a, an over and under tie, which does not give you an airtight seal. A goose neck is where you actually spin the bag so you have a long thin stream of plastic and tie a knot in it so it is airtight. Uh, my experience of using liner bags is the vendor actually taught staff how to tie the bag so that there was not an odor when it was placed in the garbage can. And once we had that process in place for our staff, um, and I worked at a facility that used the liner bags, we did not have an odor issue. There's also a way of tying them to minimize the amount of air, not to squeeze the air out, but there's a technique to tying them so that if they have to be transported and there's any kind of compression, the bag doesn't break because of air caught inside the bag. Uh, so they are technique dependent. And if you have a vendor coming in to show you the bag, make sure they understand how they can um, show you how to tie the bag so that you don't run into that problem. You still there, Heather?
I think that's all the time we have. So um, I'll let the Becker's component of this finish the presentations for us. Thank you so much for your presentation, Jim, and thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar. Bye now.